Seasonality doesn't matter as much anymore. Okay, you might, you know, there's some old, great old cheese books like Pierre and Duas cheese book, and half it's about seasonality. What's the season? What's best when? It doesn't affect because modern agriculture, a lot of its job is to get over the seasonality thing. Um, you, and again, we need to strip it back. What seasonality mean? It usually means what the animal's been fed on. Okay, so in winter time, it's generally been fed on grains, silage, or hay. Uh, as it comes on to fresh grass in Ireland, you've got spring grass, you've got summer grass, autumn grass, and then back into silage, grain, hay, or a combination. And that's going to affect the flavor. Temperatures in the maturing are going to affect the, the flavor. Generally, cheeses, like some cheese makers only make, like the glebe is only made with summer milk. But you only will make cheese when the cattle are on fresh grass. Um, and that's easy to do when you make a hard cheese because you can still sell it all year round. Um, um, but uh, other cheese, some cheese makers like Montgomery Cheddar, who make hard cheese all year round, says like in a lot of ways he prefers to make it with the winter milk because he controls what the animals are eating, and therefore will control more the flavour that ends up. Whereas when they're out in fresh grass, he doesn't know what the hell they're eating, and he doesn't know what he's going to meet in the morning when he he's working with the milk. So it's a little bit more complex, you know. You've got seasonality with some animals like goats and sheep are harder to have multiple herds where you're uh, creating milk all year round. That's why a lot of goat cheeses are only available from spring to autumn. Uh, whereas cattle, it's much easier and they have much bigger herds where you have different uh, animals calving at different times of year to, to give you an even milk all year round. Um, so really seasonality is about what they're eating. And, and because of modern feeds and stuff like that, it's not as big an issue. The first place you've got to start with cheese is you've got to look at food in general and uh, what we call speciality food um, and the type of products that we, we generally talk about in, in this area uh, when we think about it's cheese obviously but we talk about salamis and charcuterie and chutneys and jams and smoked salmon you know all this, that fancy stuff that we sometimes think of um, and before we approach any of those we need to think about where they've come from uh, to gain an understanding of them um, and the important thing about most of that food, its origins is in a way to preserve nutritious food. Uh, to preserve it either from a time of plenty, like the middle of summer, obviously, into the winter time, or from a place of plenty um, to towns and cities, maybe where there isn't big agricultural production. That's how most of these foods started out. So it's quite obvious with, with cheese, it's milk. You've got lots of fresh milk for times of the year. Um, you need to be able to do something with that to preserve it into winter time, maybe when you have no milk or little milk, or if you come from, if you're in a very uh, an area which is producing a lot of milk, more milk than's needed in that area, you can if you can turn it into something that will last, then you can trade it for other goods that you might need. Uh, the same is with salami, or you know, we, we think you know ha parma hams or whatever whatever it is. That's about a pig. You have a pig in the family, you slaughter the pig, you're not able to eat all that over the next three days, so you come up with ways of preserving it, and that's how we come across sausage hams and salamis and Irish curd hams and all those things. Um, and simple, very simple things like blackberry and apple jam in, in autumn time when there's blackberries uh, falling off the bushes. What do we do? Well, we gather, it, gather them, we eat some then, but we preserve them in, to, to make jam. And then you've got chutneys, you've got smoked salmon, when the salmon are coming up the river into the winter time, on and on and on. And it's very important to keep our feet on the ground when we're talking about these foods, that they're not, shouldn't be viewed as this kind of exclusive fancy food that's just there to tickle our tongues and uh, to make money for somebody. They're, they all come back to really, um, to, to basics. Um, so if we look at it from that point of view of cheese, uh, obviously cheese is milk, um, and we look at it from a point of view of a way to preserve that highly nutritious food that is milk. So just simply the process uh, by which we do that, any food and all those things I just talked about, all those foods I just talked about, um, it's about slowing down uh, the rotting process, slowing down bacterial growth, slowing down uh, mold growth, all those things. And the best way to do that is to extract moisture that's your fundamental. So if you look at any foods, you're talking about drying them, you know, dried fish, smoked salmon, 
using different versions, cured hams, they're all taking moisture out because bacteria and molds need moisture. And the same thing with cheese, from a larger quantity of milk we take as much moisture out as possible if we want it to preserve for a long time and that allows it to preserve. There are other things as well like salt is obviously our sugar, our great preserves, but salt is a fantastic preserve and so by taking lots of moisture out and introducing salt in then we're, 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 we're producing a product that can keep for a long time. Um, so if you take a cheese, um, the, the, there's a number of, of decision making points or decision points along the production of a cheese which decides how it's going to end up. Whether it's going to end up as a hard cheese that's going to be able to be matured for a number of years, whether it's a really soft, creamy cheese that's going to need to be eaten with a stronger flavour maybe, that's going to be need to be eaten over the next uh, number of weeks. One of the big fundamentals is in that is how much moisture we take out. So if we start the cheese making process, obviously everything starts with milk. Then from that point we add something, uh, the next step is we add something called cultures into the milk. They're generally termed starter cultures. And all that is is really a mix of bacteria. And if you ever were involved in making yogurt, you'd understand it in terms of if you get a pint of milk and you add some yogurt, some live yogurt into that, that all that milk over a period of a couple of days will turn into yogurt because the, the cultures, your starter cultures from your original yogurt, multiply within that milk if the conditions are correct. It's a little bit the same with, with, with your cheese, your milk for your cheese. If you add in some cultures, those cultures will start to multiply within that milk and they're going to be very important as to how that cheese turns out later on. The flavour of the cheese and some other points as well. So each of these cheeses here that we've got and every cheese has a different starter culture. And originally when they were being made and still the case with some cheeses, all that culture is is a little bit of yesterday's leftover whey or the waste liquid from cheese making added into today's milk. And that just replicates the cultures that we want in the cheese down through the times. Mostly though, those cultures have been isolated with modern microbiology, you know, and there's a lot of modern microbiology and science involved in even, even the most traditional cheese making now because it gives us control. It allows us to produce the best cheese that we can. So by isolating, looking at the cultures that are in those cheeses, we can decide which ones are the ones that give us really nice flavor, which ones are the ones that don't, which are the ones that create holes in the cheese later on, etc. which were what are the moulds that make it go blue. And by isolating them in labs, then we can give them back to the cheesemakers, and that's mostly what cheesemakers now use, is a pack of starter cultures. Each one probably being a little bit different for every type of cheese. So the farm cheesemaker, whether it be industrial or whether it be small farmhouse or whether you're making cheese in your own kitchen, put some form of bacterial culture, starter culture into the milk. It's put in at room body temperature, because that's the temperature we're in bacteria work the best um, and if you're making it from your own milk obviously the easy thing to do is milk the cattle, bring the milk into the vats straight away, it's still at body temperature and then add in the cultures. The next step is you add something called a rennet and a rennet is an enzyme that lives in all young mammals stomachs. If you think all man mammals by definition drink their mother's milk and they need to be able to digest that and the enzyme that we all have when we're young in our stomachs is, is, a form, is, is you know, basically a rennet and that rennet helps us break down that milk and digest it. But if we extract that rennet from a, a young animal, so like a calf's stomach, and we put it into the milk, that well, sounds pretty gory, doesn't it? That's food for you. Um, it, does, it creates a miracle. It turns that liquid milk into a kind of a jelly custard, semi-solid. Uh, semi um, so but that isn't the cheese yet because it still has the same moisture content as the milk. It's just sort of jellyish in its form. Now we start to release moisture from the curd. And as I was saying, the more moisture we take out, the longer that cheese is going to uh, last. So the first way to take moisture out is by cutting the curd. Because once you cut that curd into pieces, the more you cut it, the more moisture you're going to lose. So for something like the Glee Brown here or Parmesan, um, parmesan being one of the driest cheese, you cut the curd really, really small. Maybe it's fine for parmesan as rice grains. Um, if you're making a camembert or something like that, you're cutting it into you know, walnut-sized pieces. And that decision in terms of how you cut it is affecting how the cheese is going to turn out. 
you're also uh, monitoring the acidity level of the cheese because the bacteria that you put in at the start, what bacteria generally do is eat sugars. Um, so in cheese, it's lactose. Uh, and they turn it into lactic acid. And that's an important part of the cheese making process is that changing of lactose into lactic acid. And that's happening all through the cheese making process. So the cheese maker is monitoring that as well. And the decisions they make depends on how much uh, lactose the bacteria are allowed to eat. So now we've got this curd, whether it be in big pieces or tiny little pieces. Another little thing that you can do that some cheese makers do at this point is heat that curd. And that reinforces uh, the solid well, it, it pushes more moisture out of the curd. So these are the type of cheese we call thermophilic, and they're like Glebe, which is a cousin of Comte or Gruyere or Emmental. All those cheeses, they heat the curd, not up to pasteurization temperatures, but lower temperatures, but it's enough to tighten up those curds and expel more moisture. So we've got these curds swimming in a random way. The next thing is we need to put them in some sort of shaper to form our cheese. Obviously, that can vary from the size of a small camembert or, or smaller, or up for something like the Glebe, you know, something that will eventually end up as a 40 kilo wheel of cheese. Um, and that can be done in many ways. You can, the, the former generally is something that will allow moisture to escape, so like a basket. We call it a, a cheese mold, and it's some sort of vessel with, with the ability to leak off moisture. So you fill that, whether it be a small one or a large one, and immediately the curds start to glue back together. So, as we take the curds out of the bath, we're draining off a lot of the whey, which is going to end up being, you know, 80 to 90 percent of, of the original milk quantity. Um, and we're, we're getting these drier curds. And those drier curds, just, they're fantastic. They just stick together. Um, and they form our cheese. So say, for something like uh, the durus here, the small durus, our curd now is in a little white basket and is probably about nearly twice the height of that cheese. And um, we just tip it out, put it back in, and that the cheese is just forming into the shape and the curds are joining together and all the time more and more moisture is, is, is coming off the cheese and this is all happening quite fast and in, in a room with the, with the moisture leaking off. So now all these cheeses, whether it be a massive glebe or a little camembert or there's look fairly similar, a little bit like feta in terms of just a white curd or uh, a paneer, you know, which is basically a fresh cheese, cheese curd. Um, and, and we've got our cheese. Sometimes then if we want to, again, get rid of more moisture, allow our cheese to keep even longer, we can use pressure. So for something like the Duras, we don't use any pressure. For the Camembert, we wouldn't use any pressure. But for something like uh, the Glebe or the Clonmore here, we'd apply quite a lot of pressure. Again, pushing more moisture out because we want the cheese to last for longer. And um, it's going to obviously produce a hard cheese. So that's, now we've got our cheese in basic form. It's a few hours old it's in the form, it can come out uh, of its former. Introduction of salt is an important uh, part at this point. There's a few ways, there's two main ways that you introduce salt to the cheese. One is to, um, the way that's used in Ireland most, is where you put it in a brine bath. So the durus will go into a brine bath, which is basically a big bath of salty water, and absorbs the salt in through its skin, which also helps it form a tougher outer skin. Um, you can also use uh, dry salt, which is the glebe that uh, David Tiernan uses, where you'd apply salt onto the surface of the cheese, dry salt, and that's absorbed in that way. There are a couple other little ways, uh, say cheddaring is a very unique process that's used in England for a lot of the territorials, where they get that curd and they form it into blocks, they mix it with salt, and then they re, uh, basically put it through like a mincer, it's called a cheddaring, and, and it gives that cheddar and those cheeses that very unique kind of texture where the, the texture sort of stacks like that when you break a piece of cheddar it's uneven whereas with a glebe or something you break it it's quite even and um, so there's little you know every cheese comes from you know a different tradition everybody's inventing their own thing and all over Europe or all over the world as che each cheese developed different people found different ways of, 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 of basically preserving their milk um, so you now have your cheese in whatever size but they're all fairly similar you can break down your cheese into two, in my head anyway, I break it down into two basic groups that I think kind of simplifies things. Internally ripened cheeses and externally ripened cheeses. So internally ripened cheeses will be these two guys here. In other words, everything that's going on during the next process, which is the ripening or maturing process, is pretty much, the majority of it, is happening inside that cheese. And it happens at a very slow pace as we mature the cheese. There's very little moisture in it, which means any bacteria are moving at a gentle pace. Um, 
the enzymes continue to break down, bacteria are working away, the acidity is working away, and that happens slowly and gently. Moisture, a certain amount of moisture is coming off the cheese and it dries, you know, by about five to ten percent over, over as it's matured. Then, so that's quite a, quite a simple thing, really. Everything, there's very little that we're doing to it at this point that's going to change the cheese. Most of uh, what's formed the cheese happened in the cultures that we put in and how we extracted moisture from the cheese by cutting, pressing, heating that curd. With externally ripened cheese, it's a little bit more complex. You've always got a, almost got another whole step in it. When I externally ripened, I mean there's something going on on the surface of that cheese that is going to fundamentally change the texture and flavour of the cheese. And it's very obvious there's something going on on the outside of a Duras, and very, very obvious with this Cudini that there's something going on the outside of this. Um, and there's two, in general, there's two, two basic, basic uh, types of, this, uh, of externally ripened cheeses. There's mold ripened cheeses, which is a camembert brie, and you see that white mold on the outside, which is called penicillin candamon. Um, and that's a, a mold like any other, other mold. It's, it's introduced to the surface of the cheese, uh, either sprayed on, it can be in the maturing room, so it just settles, or it could be put in at the very start as part of the culture. But that mould, anyway, starts to grow, and it doesn't, you know, it's very flat and neat looking here, but as it grows, it's actually more like a furry white mould, like you'd see growing on a bit of food at home. Um, but as the cheese is turned and patted down, it just pats down. Um, as that uh, cheese, as that mould grows on the cheese, it starts, basically, like its roots start to change the cheese. And this is uh, an unripe, um, it's, um, camembert style Cologne. I've got a ripe camembert here, which is a little bit different, and it's really good. Do you want to open that up? Um, and you, it's a really good example. If you can see, you've got a very, very firm, chalky center, but you can see how it started to be broken down from the outside in, and that's the, the mold that's living on the surface, reaching down and breaking down the proteins and softening them up, and it also creates that mushroomy, pungent flavor that we like in camembert. Um, with the How does that take him? It takes, the, the, this would be about uh, five weeks old, um, and then for it to be fully ripe, maybe seven weeks, that kind of area. Um, or six weeks, you know. It's, it's, it's over right now. Yeah, yeah. So, you can't use it. Yeah, so j th this one is where the, you can see it's broken down all the way to the center with this camembert, and this is about seven weeks, I think. No, but yeah, a little bit less than seven weeks, six weeks. Um, and the, the molds have reached all the way through to the center and broken it down, and then that's ripe. Um, if you continue to leave that for that mold, you'll start to get a sort of secondary fermentation, get a real ammonia smell and sharp flavors, which isn't too good. So you have got a, a window between where it's fully ripe, if you like it fully ripe, to when it's going to be overripe. So with the washed drying cheese, we call these washed drying cheese these pinky slightly pungent cheeses. We're fantastic at making these in Ireland. We make uh, a few great ones like this one, Duras, Gubin, or Drahan, Malines, uh, down in Cork. And it's a very prolific way of making cheese um, using this. And this, instead of a mold living on the surface, we've got a bacteria living on the surface. We, <coughs> these are called bacterian linens, which is the main pinky kind of um, uh, bacteria that you see growing on the surface of these. Famous European ones, French ones are Pont Neveux, uh, Liveroux, Munster, Epoise, those kind of real smelly, pungent ones. Um, and it does a similar job to the, to the mold on the surface of the camembert in terms that it, you know, you can see there, still there's a kind of a bit of chalkiness, but that really soft, just under the, uh, under the surface. It's doing a similar, similar job, it's breaking down those proteins. Even more um, be even more, like it, it's not just that style, like we yeah. have that specific one, say with Ardrahan and Gubin. Gubin probably wouldn't mature, yeah. whereas Ardrahan gets very, very soft. Yeah. And even though they're the same, technically the same style of cheese, they mature completely differently yeah. as well. Yeah. And again, that, what I was saying there is really true, because it, it, it's particularly with washed on cheese, they're very, very complex. You know, when I say it's bacterial linens, it's very sim simple, because you can get so many variations within that. Because uh, what I was saying about Ardrahan, you've got a much heavier rind on the Ardrahan, a lot more linens. And in the French ones, things like a poisse, where you've got this really, and the French are much heavier on the rinds, which gives a much softer, more pungent cheese, but it's not as complex, I don't think, as things like the Duras or Malines. And the thing with Duras is, okay, they let those linens grow, but they also encourage 
things like these um, geotrichum um, yeasts on the surface and a, and a good, really complex mix of bacteria and yeasts. And that doesn't soften it quite as quickly, but it does give a more complex flavor. And also, the Ardrahan, say, the difference between Ardrahan and Gabine that Ross is talking about, in Gabine, they take more moisture out. So the, by doing that, it's not going to be able to soften up as much as Duras, where they leave more moisture in. So there's so many complex decisions, even in, in one group of cheeses. Um, and, you know, and that's just um, breaking the cheeses down into two groups is, is very simplistic because most, particularly farmhouse cheeses or traditional cheeses, have an active rind of some form. And even though this rind is completely dead now, there has been linens and other bacteria living on the surface of this during its maturing time, which have affected the flavor just underneath the surface. But really, it's these softer cheeses where the dominant flavor has been created by the rind. Um, You'll notice that these cheeses, whether it be Brie or Duras or Camembert, more or less are always made in sort of flat discs. Um, and the reason for that is, is if you made the Duras like that sort of size, you would never reach the inside of this. There's only so much of a reach, you know, a couple of centimeters that the rind can reach inside. So you'll have this very chalky center and liquid outside. Um, you have some cheeses where they purposely do that. One is Chose where it's actually lovely and they make it in that sort of shape so that you do get this mix of liquid under the rind and chalky in the center. Um, important thing to say about that and, and while looking at the Cluny and the Camembert, you know, it's not a case of it has to be soft all the way through to the center or it isn't right. If it isn't at all, it isn't good. Taste buds, smell. It's good if you taste it and you think it's lovely. You know, there are no rules. Um, and I would find Cluny generally at its nicest riper than this for sure, but still with it maybe a tiny bit of chalkiness in the surface. And it gets very, very soft and yeah. runny, it's not, it, like the, whereas the, the camembert there is, is not as perfect at that, that stage yeah. of the Kalinis. You know, so a lot of people might say they see a tiny bit of chalk and go, oh no, that's not ready yet. You know, again, taste, you know, because that's what'll tell you whether cheese is nice or not. Um, so that's, that's your basic, you know, You've got a living rind on, on these externally ripened cheeses that are affecting and breaking down the cheese, creating the flavor, creating the texture. In the harder cheeses, most of it is a much slower process. These type of cheeses generally, particularly ones with very active rinds, eight, nine, 10 weeks is the kind of age for them. With these ones, as I say, up to a number of years. Then you've got blue cheese. Where does that fit into it? In my strange brain, it, it fits in sort of like as if it has its rind, it's inside out. It's got its rind on the inside. So I still put it more into this category. Um, at the start, when we were talking about introducing the cultures at the start, the starter cultures, huh? um, one of them with, with Cacha Blue would be Penicillum Rock 40. And that's just a blue spore um, of a particular mold, which we find very tasty. Um, and that's introduced into the milk. And then as that cheese matures and pre you know, put together, it's the same as any other cheese. But after a number of time, depending on the cheese, maybe a couple of weeks, the cheese is pierced with stainless steel rods in this case, and you can probably hopefully see the points there, the holes across the cheese. And what that does is it introduces oxygen, because of course the, the, the mold already has moisture and it has a basic food to grow in there. But once you introduce, you introduce oxygen, it comes alive and it starts to grow. Um, and then it can grow within the cavities. So with most blue cheeses, you wouldn't press them. You let the curds to be quite loose so that you have these cavities that the blue can grow in. Um, and the flavor of the blue, that flavor that we associate with blue is not only in the actual mold itself, but it also breaks down and softens up the cheese around it like a rind would in, in one of these cheeses. It's also affecting it. So even the bits that aren't blue taste the blue, so to speak. Mm. All Rockford needs to be made, legally has to be made in those caves, uh, or, or matured in, in those caves. And the reason, you could make Rockford somewhere else and, and design the kind of airflows and systems and make Rockford, and it'd be fairly hard to tell the difference. But the French like their traditions, which is, I think, a good thing. And the Rockford became famous uh, because it was being matured in that area, which has a particular temperature, very even temperature, and particular airflows uh, that help to develop that cheese. But the original Roquefort spore it comes from a rye bread and is a type of mold that grows in rye bread and it needs to be introduced. 
some uh, blue cheeses, you, you put the culture in at the start, but other blue cheeses, are in, uh, the mold is introduced atmospherically afterwards. So other cheeses like Cabrales would be a famous one in the north of Spain, where they don't introduce any blue into cheese. They don't even pierce it. There's just natural cracks in it. But there's so much blue mold being developed in the caves where it's being matured, it starts to get in and, and, and ripen the cheese. So within the caves of Roquefort, apart from the blue being put in, there is this massive amount of blue spores traveling along the air systems within the caves that are, are helping develop the cheeses. At the point where we put the milk into the vat, before we put the culture in, there's another decision which is now available to cheesemakers in the last 100 years or whatever, and that is, do I pasteurize the milk or not? Um, pasteurization um, is controversial, uh, controversial enough within cheese making. It's very, very useful and actually very, very necessary in a lot of cheese production and a lot of food production because it, what it does is it gives a guarantee at that moment in time that the milk has got no bacteria in it. If there's no bacteria in it, then it can't have any pathogens, pathogens being bacteria that we don't like that are harmful to us. Um, so what it does is it, 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 it gives that point, it's, it's CCP, it's, it's, at that point we can guarantee, but at the moment, that it's, it's bacteria free. And by doing this, uh, it allows us to gather milk from a very, you know, a, l a large amount of areas, so Glombia's trucks can go out, they can go out to 200 farmers over a number of days with a tanker, pick up milk that may be sitting in a tank on a farm for two days, and you don't need to really worry about it, about what was going on, because you know before you make your cheese or your milk powder, whatever you're going to do with that Colombia milk, you're pasteurizing. So you're safe from that point, and now we only need to worry from that point forward. So it's a really, really useful tool. And you can't make, really, I would say, industrial cheese without pasteurization. The problem, where the problem with pasteurization is, it not only kills the pathogens, but it kills uh, productive, uh, positive bacteria that create good flavor within the cheese. Um, so you're getting rid of your pathogens, but you're throwing the baby out as well. Um, which is fine for your industrial cheese because it's absolutely necessary. But if you come to a farmhouse cheese like Duras, her single farmer delivers the milk that morning to her. She knows where that milk is coming from. That, milk, that farmer is, uh, has a relationship with her whereby he's watching the animals for disease, etc., etc. So it's within a controlled environment. So we're not able, by making Duras with raw milk, we're not able to say from this point on, at this pasteurizing point, we don't need to worry about that. We have to go right back and it gives more responsibility for the cheesemaker to have a relationship with the farmer, or in a lot of cases like Lee Brown or Clonmore, where they produce the milk themselves, and they need to have control out of it. So unpasteurized cheese really only works where you can control the process right from the point of milking the health of the animals. Um, the bonus you get if you're able to control that is that you get better flavor cheese. And I don't say you might get better flavor, you do get better flavor cheese. It doesn't mean that there aren't really great a really lovely uh, pasteurized cheeses. Clonmore is, Cashel Blue is, really lovely. And you can get really crap raw milk cheeses because there's so many other elements. But by using raw milk, it gives you a much better chance of making a great cheese. So you've got more complex flavors because you're introducing those starter cultures that mix the bacteria, but by using raw milk, you're also getting nature's bacteria coming from the land where you're producing the cheese. That ripening process, you know, is different for each cheese. The temperature, you know, because when you're making dirt, you want to create an atmosphere where this bacteria and these geotrichomes love to grow. So you, you create a really, really moist, high humidity uh, environment. And that's the same for most cheeses. They like high humidity, um, but this one particularly. And sometimes you, and you wash the cheeses, that's why they're nicknamed wash drying cheeses. Um, you know, slightly drier humidity for growing this mold, but still reasonably high humidity, slightly lower temperature, you know, and each cheese has its own optimum level of, of, of temperature and humidity. And that's why you often think of caves or cellars for maturing cheeses. And the reason for that is pre uh, uh, mechanized refrigeration, when you, before you can control the refrigeration of a room like this by introducing a, a fridge on the ceiling or whatever, you have to go somewhere where it's got a naturally all year round cool temperature and underground is the best way to go if you want to guarantee that and that's why we think of cellars and caves because they're underground and so have a, an even temperature usually about 16 to 18 degrees is perfect for maturing cheese. You're all in an incredible time to be in the food industry or whatever you want to call it as students of food 
it's phenomenal. It'll be looked back as as just this this you know from about you know right back to the early seventies, but it's really peaking and well, hopefully not peaking, but really coming into a multiplier effect at the moment. We have incredible Irish food producers uh, starting up all the time at the moment. Um, we've got amazing natural resources in terms of our agriculture, um, which allows us to produce this great food. Uh, and cheese is one of the ones that obviously benefits from that. Um, but yet we don't have this food culture and cheese culture that other countries have benefited from, like France and Italy and Spain, where they've got specific geographical areas that have cheese traditions that have remained and survived and been passed down. And that's how we get Camembert AOC from Normandy, or we get Roquefort, you know, uh, or we get Comte from French Comte, where these traditions have been preserved and passed down. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't make just as good cheese and in some ways make better cheese. Because the flip side of, the, of tradition in terms of what it gives us, it gives us these old recipes, these, this fantastic knowledge from the past and diversity of area. It also gives us, it restricts us. Because if I'm in French Comte making Comte, I have to make it in a particular way. Which again, we see as positive because it preserves the tradition. But it inhibits creativity. Because if I have to make the cheese in that particular type of way, then I can't experiment. And if I can't experiment, I can't create new things. So in Ireland, there was really, you know, cheese making pretty much outside of industrial cheese making had more or less, even though there was bits and pieces happening, it wasn't really dead, died off. In the early 70s, people like Veronica Steele makes Molines, Helen Williams makes Coulet, started making cheese in their homes in their, uh, for different reasons, with Helen Williams just to feed her kids. Uh, because you couldn't buy any decent cheese with Veronica just to try something new to turn milk into something different and then more and more mostly women in, in dairy farms saw this as a way to start making cheese to turn very low milk prices and this is continuing now it's something where they can make a bit more money off um, and because we've got such great milk and because we have this uh, introduction of creativity through lack of rules we, we've, we've had the sprouting of so many fantastic cheeses uh, and I suppose in ways of creating new traditions so you've got things like Jeff O'Gill, um, Breda Marr, um, the Grubb family, uh, David Turner is quite a recent addition you know, in the last five years making this cheese. It's phenomenal and it's not only happening within cheeses, at the moment we're just totally on, on the buzz of Irish arts and foods. And it's, it's great, like we've got simple things like Mellis Fudge from West Cork or rapeseed oil from County Loud or we've got a new chocolate maker just come on board, our uh, biscuit maker come on board from County Cork. And, you know, when we started off it was very much, okay, we've got our few bits of Irish farmers, she's great, but most of our emphasis were about looking in Italy and looking in France and looking in Spain at the best food that we can bring into Ireland and, you know, introduce the stuff that isn't available here and the really genuinely good stuff. Now, we're just we're not interested in that anymore. What we're interested in is okay. We're keeping you know our main good products, but we're looking more and more for more Irish produced foods. And hopefully, some of you people here will go on and either work with a food producer or become uh, those food producers because it really is it's there to be done. So, just back to Irish farmers' cheese. Sorry, I have the ability to go all directions. But um, one thing. Again, looking and breaking down, like we were talking about, the, the idea of a cave, we sort of have this acceptance. We need to look at what, what is farmhouse cheese. It's no good for me to stand up and say, I like farmhouse cheese, here's farmhouse cheese, and then you two all go away going, yes, farmhouse cheese, we must use farmhouse cheese. What is farmhouse cheese? We need to understand it. You can't have an opinion about something unless you can understand what it means. And farmhouse one of the, uh, is a term that you see on some soup in the supermarket, you know, made in a massive factory. So is that, you know, what, you know, and this is one of the debates that's really live at the moment in terms of labeling, product labeling, and, and, you know, pushing people like us, pushing for stricter labeling laws so that people, when they use terms like farmhouse or artisan, it has to mean something. To me, what farmhouse cheese means is two basic things. This is, again, very generalized. Place and person. So in order to be what I talk about at farmhouse cheese, it needs to come from a specific geographical area. It needs to be off a place. People were used to that kind of idea from wine growing, where they use terms like terroir. You know, the, the vines are from a specific, specific, even with wine, specific, you know, a few hundred meters kind of uh, area, a particular slope with a particular soil, with a particular sun, the way the sun shines, it, etc. A uh, little bit broader with, with, with the cheese, but certainly the soil, the, the farming culture, the fields are different in a specific area. In the, on the Sheepshead Peninsula where the milk from this comes to 
uh, up around RD in County Loud where this comes from. So you've got a different, a different geographical area, a different culture of farming, and that, all that thing very, very subtly changes the milk. And it is very, very subtle. And that's the place. Whereas if we look at what isn't farmhouse cheese, what we might call industrial cheese, uh, larger production cheese, you gather milk from a very large area. So like as if you were making wine and you gathered your grapes from, you know, the whole, a whole province, you know, winemakers would be going, like, you can't, you can't do that because you're going to lose all the individuality flavors of the grapes. Same thing with milk. If you're making, you know, Charleville or whatever, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of farmers from a massive area all feeding in with their milk. And so that dilutes and becomes an even. It gets rid of the intricacies, you know, the little variances that are in that particular milk, and also gets rid of those seasonal variations and all those other things. Um, so your place is so important. The next thing is the person, and I think that's probably more important even than the place, and that's a craftsperson. With any farmhouse or artisan cheeses or foods, you need uh, the craftsperson involved. And it's very similar to an example sometimes I use is, is making a table, you know. This table has obviously been industrial produced, you know, engineers have designed the lay, you know, the, the measurements of this, the way it's been planed, you know, it's a functional ground table. If I gave this draw, a drawing of this to a craftsperson who was able to do a bit of welding, a bit of metal work, and a bit of, of uh, uh, woodwork, and I told them to make it exactly the same, it would sit here beside it, but I would bet that most of you would find this one more attractive. The reason why you find it more attractive is because we find more attractive things where people, a person, a cross person have been involved. And it's often the mistakes, the little things, the little imperfections that make it easier on our eyes, uh, the unevenness that makes it more attractive to us as humans. We just are more attracted to that more natural look. And when you're making food in the same way, not necessarily mistakes, but when Jeff was making Duras, she is making daily decisions uh, which reflect her. She's tasting the curd to make decisions of whether to cut it a little bit longer, whether to leave it in the in the um, in the vat for a longer amount of time in the way, the temperature. She, she's tasting, she's smelling, and that craftsperson's making those decisions, which makes a more complex, more interesting food product. In the same way as if you know you're cooking in a, a meal, you know, can you invent a machine to, to make the difference of that sec few seconds difference to leave that piece of meat in the pan, which the information you're taking in is to your nose, maybe you're tasting your, your experience in terms of looking at that piece of meat. If you said that every single steak needed to be cut for exactly, you know, 7.2 minutes, and you always cook this, you're, you're not going to get as good a product as if there's a person, a cross person involved there who's making decisions because each steak isn't different, the wind is blowing in a different way, somebody opened the door, there's some cold there, the cooker isn't working the same each day. So when you have a person interacting with that food, you get a more interesting, and sometimes an inconsistent product, um, but I don't think inconsistency in that way is, is a bad thing. So that, for me, is just a kind of explanation of, of what farmhouse means. Um, and then Irish farmhouse, of course, as I was saying, being this, this, this relatively new thing, without restriction, and in diff the difference between, again, most classic European cheeses is that classic European cheeses are made not by, you know, there are <coughs> generally several families or several businesses making a single type of cheese, <coughs> whether it be Camembert, Revachon, Comte. Some of those cheeses maybe have three people, different families making it, some like Comte have hundreds. <coughs> and they all can make the cheese, once they make the cheese in the specific region, following the certain rules, they can call their cheese Comte. Only Jeff Gill can make Duras, uh, or her family, or who she allows to make that Duras. So our cheeses are attached to people, uh, to families, as opposed to, to areas. So it is a slightly different uh, tradition. And maybe that will change over time. Maybe in 100 years' time, Duras will be made by seven families on, on the Sheepshead Peninsula, all making their own variation, and maybe we'll, we'll make that point, and maybe there will be government rules about how that's to be made. When you're tasting, and you probably know a lot more about this because I'm not a professional, you know, but you know, you know the basics, all the tastes on your tongue, the rest of the stuff is happening up here in your nose. Breathe out. Imagine all that flavor that's in your mouth, that's on the cheese, coming back up, up through the top of your mouth and back out your nose. So you're breathing it out and allow 
the time to do that. And that's where you'll catch the uh, more delicate, subtle aromas, which we call them, which is really what we're talking about when we're talking about the taste of cheese. Because, of course, the taste is either salty, sharp, salty, sweet, etc., etc. But the complexity is in the nose. You need to come to new cheeses, particularly Irish farmhouse cheeses, if you haven't tasted them before, with a blank slate. And sometimes it's good if you haven't tasted cheese before, don't have that preconception. Just smell it and just taste it and think from that point. Don't think about what you expect it to taste like, but really in itself to get down to whether you enjoy it or not. Ross, what's your...? Just, um, it should be a little bit musty, but like a, of a cabbage or on, yeah. on, the, on the mold on the outside. Um, it's not fully ripe, so you're no. not going to get the full uh, so aroma from yeah, it. Yeah, it's quite light. You, you are getting that kind of white cap mushroom, if you broke open a mushroom. Very similar kind of aroma. And that's the penicillin candleman, very, very simple. So mostly, because this is an underdeveloped cheese, you're getting that, that kind of yeasty, mushroomy smell, and with kind of earthiness, and, and quite lactic still as well. There's a little bit of acidity afterwards. You know, when, you, when you're tasting, I know probably you've got too small a piece there. Anybody wants another piece, uh, there, there's a little bit more. So to allow that, allow yourself to, uh, to get as much. Now, this one is quite a simple cheese, especially because it's so little ripeness to it, that you're not going to get that much of a complexity. But there is, I mean, you could talk, Ross mentioned cabbage there. I mean, you could fresh uh, uncooked cauliflower will be something, again, as, as I do that. And that's a skill which I'm pretty crap at, I have to say. I've been able to articulate, uh, you know, to, to identify and articulate those different compounds that you're experiencing when you're tasting. But, and sometimes we can think of it as quite bullshitty, uh, sorry for the camera, um, <laughs> or, you know, we, we, we're used to this, particularly in the 90s, these wine people, you know, it's all full of blah, 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 blah. Uh, and we think, oh, that's just crap, you know, it's not as lovely or it's not. But, Particularly as food professionals, it's a tool, and I think in Ireland a tool that we need to learn more. It's a skill. But, but that smell is, as I say, you know, when you're chew eating that, that, that cheese or that, that food, it is going back up through your nose and, and giving you those messages. And again, there's, there's two ways of eating food. You know, when we're sitting down eating our sandwich at lunchtime, or even a nice meal, and we're having a chat with somebody, maybe a convivial kind of meal, we're not kind of going, you know, so I've got a bit of mushroom going on there, and there's a bit of hazelnut, and I can taste a bit of nutmeg. Um, but you, I think that as food professionals, again, we need to be able to switch it on when it can be of help to us. Um, and so, because it, it's like we Ross was saying about Cristiano, the incredible thing that I find about people like him, professionals like him, is, and it only comes with time out of training yourself, is to be able to articulate. Everybody's pretty much in here will be able to sense the same things as Cristiano does. But he has trained himself to be able to break them down in his own mind and then to articulate, to pick words, to use them. And every time he uses them, you go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's in there. And, cause you're just, and it's a skill, a skill you need to develop. So I would recommend, you know, something that people do do. You know? Cauliflower was the one I picked up when you came out. Yeah, there. yeah, and it's just that when somebody says it, you go, yeah, that's it. So there is lots, even in this very simple cheese, we've got, you know, white cap mushrooms, cauliflower, the sort of that lactic acid kind of thing that happens at the end. This is a raw milk cheese, and again, it's underdeveloped, so you don't get the full thing, but one of the great things about raw milk cheeses tends to be the length of flavor as it develops in your mouth. It tends to have more length. What will we taste next, Russ? Um, do you want to do the uh, camembert? Mm, yeah, of course, yeah, the camembert, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, who, uh, does everybody have a piece of his camembert? Because it wasn't actually on the plate. I think everybody should have it now. So if you, you can e even see just from looking at it that it's much softer. Uh, the chalkiness, the chalkiness that was on the Cullini is, is not uh, replicated here in the in the, the camembert. So it's like it's peak ripeness really. Yeah. 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 So uh, just everybody have a smell of it first. And you can even immediately like it's a it's a different smell to the pre the the, the coulini, yeah. you know. You've still got that mushroominess, yeah. but it's more slightly damp yeah. mushroom. Uh, 
you know, a little bit like a, uh, a slight, slightly more rotted. And you know, and that's because that's what's actually gone on. That mould has rot rotted the milk, and you can smell that. But in in a fungal kind of mushroomy way, you know, slightly more like a big, bigger open mushroom with a little bit of dampness on it. And there's also kind of a finer, um, tiny, you know, not the right word, but slight sharpness to it. And that's ammonia starting to come in there. You can't really get it yet, which is good. It's just at that point, at that point of ripeness, where it's, it's a very much a background. Once you focus on it, then you should be able to get it. Mm. <laughs> Pop it in your mouth, breathe out through your nose. <laughs> this cheese, which is dominated so much by one factor, which is its mold, is more singular in its flavor. You know, it's so dominated, it's so dominated by that rind. And this is something we discover when we taste the durs, we get into more complexity. That mold is so dominant, dominant that we really are left. It's hard, you know. You could say some sort of melted white chocolate, kind of, in there. You know, that's um, going on sort of as some of the depth to it. Um, I'd say that wet cap mushroom, um, a little bit of ammonia, but but we're talking about not a not a massive variance in, in not, not a massively complex flavor, but. Um, and you know, I find that Cudini, even though it's underripe, really, really pleasant as well alongside that. Even though initially most people and most cheese professionals would see it and go, I'm not even trying that, look, it's totally underripe. But again, to come to it with an open mind. Okay. Um, so next we'll do... Durs? Yeah, okay. So the Durs, which is the one with the pinky, and you might have a little bit of blue speck, a little bit of white on the, on the, on the rind. Don't eat the rind yet, okay? Just eat the paste. Yeah, it's a break in half. But smell, yeah, the Durs, with the slightly pinky rind, kind of thick slice, yeah? We all got it? Yeah. Yeah, well, your tongue has basic, I mean, again, again, I'm not great in the science thing, but it has, you know, salt, sweet, uh, what is it, bitter, sour, new ma you mammy, or whatever it's called. New mammy. <laughs> your mammy, uh, which is very much that cheesy kind of savory flavor. But most of the information we're getting, we're getting through our nose. You know, all these cheeses are going to hit the salt, slightly sour parts of our tongue. But really where everything's going on is back up through our nose. So the aroma of this is quite light. Um, it's uh, Ross. What he got there? Durs. Hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yeah. 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 No, it's it's quite delicate. Um, the aroma I generally get. It's hard to pick off this, but it's slightly more animal than the previous one. We were talking about in the previous one that very mushroomy uh, uh, smell. In this one, it's a little bit more barney, you know. It does smell uh, uh, agricultural. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could go different directions in your description there. The way I, you know, it's a, it's a, but it's a clean barn. I don't know if anybody from farming backgrounds or goes visit farms or your family in farms, if you go into a milking parlour and it's been hosed out and washed out, so it's got a clean animal smell, very different to, you know, uh, uh, something unpleasant. So it's, it's, a, it's a meatier start than, than, the, than the fungal kind of camembert. In its flavour, immediately more to it. Do you find that? broader in your mouth, I find, and harder to pinpoint, more complex, more levels of flavor. Um, one of the reasons for this is it doesn't have such a dominant force as, as the camembert does, where the camembert's got this very singular can, can of penicillin, whereas this has got the, 
the B linens for sure, but it's got geotrichums, it's got other lots of complex molds and bacteria on there, allowing, and the rind isn't as dominant either, you've got the flavour of the actual milk as well as it's developed. So, um, you picking up anything there, Ross, that you could describe? It was something that I, uh, and I just couldn't. Well, the is actually made of acidic. Like, yep. Uh, sour. Definitely on the uh, when you smelt it on the smelt first, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That sharpness. Then. Yeah. Um, um, I find the flavors are more animal. Again, generally we can break down most of the flavors. I think anyway, in top of my head, into kind of herbal, floral, vegetal kind of flavors or more animal flavors animal flavors being like leather, fat, uh, you know, all those things. And I think this goes more to, uh, on the animal side of our, of our flavor, uh, much more savory. And uh, there's a, um, although there is kind of a, some kind of maybe cooked nuts kind of in there, um, there's all, but, but dominant to me is that kind of uh, cooked fat. Flavor. You can see actually how it's really good for cooking with actually just yeah. there when you because it's actually really nice and at room temperature now. It's yeah, it's has to break down really nicely. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, the reason why I said don't need to rind immediately with those cheeses like the washed rind cheeses, the rind tends to be have a more dominant singular flavour, and if you taste it all at once, it can dominate the flavour of the paste, so you miss some of the subtle flavours. So particularly if I'm tasting as an actual tasting, I'll always eat the flesh of the cheese, the, the inside of the cheese first on its own to try and, and get the, the more complex flavours, then if I want or not to taste some of the rind with it. If you're not eating the rind, it's always very important to eat right up to the edge of the rind and we'll maybe come to that when we talk about the glebe a little bit more. It's a better demonstration. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about this particular wheel of Clonmore. Have you tried it? No, so we taste a glebe next. Okay, we'll taste a glebe brehan next. The glebe is, uh, it, it's just a little square of cheesy looking cheese on your plate. Now, the smell, you're not going to get very little smell off that until you break it because all the, the, you know, everything is sort of floated away that's on the surface. So you've got to break it and then smell. Mmm, and that is gorgeous. Everybody got that? Yeah, 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 that kind of lacticness coming out in the yogurty. Um, there's a kind of a... Uh, yeah, kind of a, a woodland kind of herbal kind of... Uh, also, a broth. I mean, that's for me the dominant thing is is, you know, a, a, a beef broth, almost oxtail soup. You know, that kind of condensed meatiness with that kind of saltiness to it, if you, if you imagine that. And it's complex as a really nice broth as well in terms of, of those, you know, cooked vegetables. Very much more a cooked <coughs> flavour coming off. Not, that it, not as, as primal or primary uh, as, the, as particularly the first one where it's really, you know, the mushrooms and that kind of stuff, the cauliflower and all cooked. Whereas this much more, much more cooked onions, cooked broth, cooked vegetables, and even if you were to, yeah, you know, cooked cabbage, caramelized onions, yeah, often one we use for this type of cheese. And, and, you know, does that relate back to the fact that the milk is actually cooked in the vat? Not to a high temperature, but it is, you know, and so you can maybe start relating some of those things back. Um, and then you, then you start to eat it, and you get a whole other level in there. Um, sorry, the pieces are so tiny; it's quite difficult to do. Um, again, there's a little bit of well, you don't get in the nose at all. Is any bitterness? You do get a little bit of bitterness. I think this is a really good glee brand. Um, again, you should have bigger pieces, but. Uh, um, you do get, but it's, it's, it's a positive bitterness. It's kind of a chicory, um, you know, that kind of green vegetable kind of bitterness, spinach almost kind of, um, along with, behind that then, the broth.
Bitterness is something that I've argued with myself, huh, if that makes sense, over the years. When I started eating cheese, and started pretty much the same time as I started selling cheese, because I was just started doing it, uh, and I've learned along the way, very much so. Um, like everybody, uh, and a little bit like we start drinking, you know, we start off with cider or what do they call those? Alco pops and, and that kind of sweet taste, and it's a while maybe before we start drinking pints of Guinness or, or whiskies, uh, because we have to allow our, um, our, our mouth to develop. Yeah. And the next one is going to be goats, cow's milk so far. Um, but bitterness is something that our whole society has been moving away from in flavor. You can see it in the food products. If you try and find a, 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 a processed food that has no sugar in it, I'm, I'm not talking about sweets, I'm talking about sauces, I'm talking about all those things. Sugar, sugar, sugar. You read the back ingredients, it's all in it. Or some sort of oos, like fructose or whatever, uh, different oils and stuff. And it's the same in cheese. You know, there's the sweeter cheeses. Dubliner is a really good example where they've used different starter cultures to reduce the amount of acid produced to give a kind of a sweeter cheese. And that's one of the reasons why it's so popular. It's quite sweet. Industrial cheeses that are really, you know, Emmental is quite a sweet one. They're, they're quite sweet cheeses, and that's where everybody is moving because it's kind of a, an instant hit. And in the kind of world that we live in, we're looking for instant, and we, we only judge an instant. And so we find automatically, uh, and I did in the past, and, 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 and almost to get over it, that if we sense bitterness in something like a cheese, we automatically recoil from it and say, oh, that's bad. And, and by doing that, even in your own mouth, even while you're tasting it, the decisions and thoughts and preconceptions that you bring to the flavor can influence how much you enjoy it. I know that can sound strange. In other words, if you get two people from two different cultures who expect different things from their food, one will find something absolutely disgusting and go, oh my god, that's horrible. And the other person, you know, maybe the two 12-year-old boys will go, oh no, I love that, it's yummy because it depends on how, what preconceptions they build up in the type of food that they've eaten and how they think about food. So it's not only about fact in terms of the message that it's, it's giving to our noses and our mouths, it's also about what we bring to it. And as a professional, again, coming back to that, you need to try and get rid of those preconceptions and enjoy the cheese for itself. So again, back to bitterness is not necessarily a bad thing. It's about everything in balance, you know, and I think that the tiny bit of bitterness in that was so well balanced. Goat's milk is always pale, uh, is, uh, and sheep's milk are always paler, so it's why when you might find a little few pokey holes in it, if the curd is open. This is made down in uh, County Cork in, uh, near Charleville by Tom Began. Very small goat hair, we sell most of what he makes. Um, internally ripened, very little going on in the rind, in fact the rind is inhibited by a kind of a coating that's on it. Um, this is, well, it's so last summer, I wonder what month it is, July of last year. Normally, we'd sell this a little bit younger than it is. Again, break it open, and you've got, I have here, I don't know if you have enough, but my initial thing is slightly unpleasant in, in that it is, uh, there's an acidity to it. Some people refer to it as baby sick. Um, I, I, I said baby sick, can some people, have, oh the Clonmore, okay sorry, Clonmore. Um, but there's a sharpness to it, no, no it hasn't, but, but if you go digging in deep in there. So there's definitely an acidity and a sharpness to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, in terms of saying mustard, in terms of that burning sensation that you're getting, what that is is we haven't got enough moisture out of this cheese for it to be matured for as long as it has been. That's our bottom line with that. And you'll find that in lots of farmhouse mature cheese. They're maturing them too long for the amount of moisture that they've managed to get in the first place. Or the fat content is too high and you get that sharpness. And that sharpness, often people go, oh, that sharpness is great, give me something sharp. I don't like it, I think it inhibits the rest of the flavors. Because this is one of the most gorgeous cheeses when it's right and when it's younger. Um, but it's not bad, you know? And if you enjoy it, you enjoy it. Um, but I think it's unfortunate. Bit of Sheridan's chutney with that. Bit of Sheridan's chutney with that's lovely. 
<laughs> but some of the flavors behind that, if you, if, you, if you kind of can in your own mouth, in your own mind, put aside the, that acidity and try, you, I, I, there's always, and I can still taste it in this, and one of my favorite things about Clonmore is this amazing vanilla. Um, uh, kind of butterscotch um, flavor to it. That's quite unique in any goat's cheese I've had. Really, really pleasant. When the cheese is a bit younger and we don't have that acidity, you can experience it much more. But it, I'm still getting it in that. Really lovely. Um, okay, cooked milk um, and all the things that come from that. Our last cheese is going to be uh, blue. Just cashew blue. Uh, it's about 10 weeks old, so it's not very, very mature, but it's quite mature. It's still quite light, quite pleasant. Uh, you probably all need a drink of water after the comma. So, Ross? Uh, it's lovely, fragrant, fresh smell, even mm. though still often, like it's still get that, um, oh gosh. You get the the, the, the the blue smell. Yeah, kind of a yeasty. Yeast, yeah. Uh, salt. Um, and sweet. You know, there. You're obviously your tree dominant things in any blue. You'll you'll generally get anyway. Um, and a, and a good level of acidity as well. So dominant in your mouth, you're finding that probably that saltiness, sweet background, uh, the kind of vinegary that somebody used earlier, very well acidity, but it is quite balanced. Yeah. There's nothing there that really jumps out. Yeah. And says this one, like it's very balanced. Generally, what we're always well, no, generally what I am always looking at, looking for when I taste the cheese, is balance, and that sounds quite obvious. But we're looking for in this case in the cashew, that acidity, the sharpness, the saltiness, to come up together in the exact same way as if you're cooking any meal. You're looking so that none of your flavors are dominating, but they're enhancing each other and they're coming up together. And that's what we're always looking for in cheese. You don't want anything jumping out, you know, and taking lead. You want them to come together. And the cashew blue for blue cheese does that really, really well. Yeah, I think like even comparing to some of the best European and mm. French blues, cashew blue stands up there mm. uh, and is uh, parallel to any of them. I mean, mm. it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Particularly, it's in really nice condition at the moment. Yeah. It's nice and soft and creamy, and you, you really do get that nice balanced flavour. Because some blues, like say with Roquefort, Roquefort mm. will leave a very peppery aftertaste, whereas the, um, the uh, cashew blue there, it's lovely. There's not nice taste on, on the palate now afterwards. It's really, really nice. What kind of flavour do they get as well as the blue? Well, and you will get, because of the blue, you'll get that little bit of pepper. You will get that little bit of heat on, on your palate as well, you know? But yeah, as you said. No, but, but it's quite interesting. For, with the dominance of the actual, what, what we call the tastes in that, are dominating. And there's not that much complexity coming through in secondary aromas. I, I mean, I... Same yeah, but also it isn't that complex a cheese, you know. It's it's uh, it doesn't have a fantastic length of flavour. I wouldn't say very pleasant, very pleasing on your palate, but sort of stops short of going anywhere. Of some of the other ones, like the Glee particularly, or maybe the Duras, to have the complexity and lengths of flavour to bring you places. The Cashew kind of gives it all, and then it's kind of finished. Yeah, yeah. Still, to really kind of, if you weren't expecting, if you kind of get your breath on the side. The, the, the blue, yeah. yeah. Your taste buds are what will tell you whether cheese is good or not, and that's a decision that you need to make, and you're, you're more qualified than most people as, as uh, food professionals. Um, and that's part of the process you're going through now. And I would say to always trust educate first of all your taste buds, your sense of smell, and then you'll be able to make decisions. Um, and those decisions are really very simple when it comes to cheese. Is this nice or isn't it? 
you know. And if it's still nice, then I can use it. If it isn't, then I can't use it. You know, uh, once a, a cheese becomes, uh, and it's very few cheeses, or it will take a long time for, for some cheeses to get to that point, you know. Um, these ones, you know, would never really, they, they, they decrease in quality as opposed to, you know, go off. Whereas these ones decrease in quality but at a faster rate to a point where they're no longer nice. But that's really a decision. There's not, not so much, you know, what can you do with the pigs, with the pigs really. You know, once it goes past the point that it's enjoyable, and that's what we're all looking for. But that isn't about the best before date on the back of it. That's just an indication, something to allow us uh, in shops where we, don't have, where we can't taste everything all the time, to allow us to make decisions at the probable time when that's nice or not nice. But particularly with farmhouse cheese, that varies from season to season, with batch to batch. So that's only an indicator, whereas your nose and your taste buds are going to really give you the proper information that you need to use. Controls. So why do we use refrigeration in any food? Again, coming back, there's different ways of inhibiting the growth of bacteria and molds uh, and other rotting agents, so to speak. Uh, one is salt, lack of moisture. Another one is temperature. So if you lower the temperature, like all of us, we start to work a little bit slowly. So if you're hanging out in, you know, three degrees, you probably won't, you know, you, it's harder to work. And the bacteria find it harder to work. They work, you know, at an optimum temperature, or whatever, 30 something degrees body temperature. Uh, whereas below five degrees, they still continue to work, but very, very slowly. So by refrigerating our cheese at that temperature, we're kind of putting the cheese in stasis, very little development, and so it should stay at more or less the maturity. But it does continue to mature, and some cheeses like to be matured at that lower temperature. Most cheeses are matured at about 12, 14, 16 degrees, where the bacteria aren't working really fast because they can overwork and cause problems, but where they're not so cold that they're not able to do anything and develop, develop the cheese. This is the kind of irony with, with this type of food product. You're, in one hand, you're preserving the milk, you're preserving the food, so you're trying to do things to inhibit the growth of bacteria and molds. But on the other hand, all of your flavor of the cheese and everything else depends on bacterial growth and mold growth. So it's controlled rotting is what cheese, in fact, is. It's the process of being in control of the rotting process to give you the results that you want. Um, rather than the, the molds and bacteria taking control and going where they want, which is complete annihilation for the milk. You know, definitely twice a year, I'd say, over the last few years anyway, a, uh, a, a point where one of the cheeses that we use, um, something's been found. In my experience, it's always been listeria. Uh, now, because our controls are so good, and I mean our, I mean the, the whole industry, um, from the farmer to the producer to, to ourselves all the way through, we tend to catch them before they even hit the shelves because there's testing going on. And the nice thing about the cheeses, particularly hard cheese, is you have a number of time, you have a, a length of time, even with some of the softer cheeses of six weeks or whatever, to test the cheese and to make sure that there's no problem. So we tend to catch. Um, but listeria is a funny one because listeria is one of the reasons why a lot of people say, say pregnant women can't eat unpasteurized cheese. That's what we're told. Um, but listeria has very, very little got to do with pasteurization because pasteurization, as I said, picks a point in time and guarantees the milk has no bacteria like listeria in it at that point. But once you make, say, if you made Duracell of pasteurized milk, once you then go through your process and now it's in the maturing room where these bacteria are growing on it, in order to make them, help them grow, you wash the cheese, you might introduce a little bit of salt, you're turning it, you're brushing it. And a good example of, of one pasteurized cheese that did get listeria was it was in a farmyard, you have a yard. Listeria likes damp areas, that's why it likes to live in this type of rind. Uh, lives in gutters, really great place to grow uh, listeria. Listeria in the gutter, gutter was dripping down because it hadn't been cleaned out properly. There's a pool of water in the yard, somebody walked into the pool of water, they didn't put under plastic covers or whatever. Somebody dropped maybe a brush that you used for brushing the cheese onto the floor. Now you've got listeria on your brush, now you're brushing your cheeses. Now the cheese is listeria and it's out and it's a danger. How would have pasteurized prevented that from happening? It couldn't, because it happened back here. It's only a single point of guarantee. All that it does is say that there will be no bacteria that could be picked up from the others of the animal by cross-contamination with feces, etc. It doesn't prevent any other subsequent cross-contamination. So it's not a complete deal. Um, so it does happen. But as I say, regardless of whether she's pasteurized or unpasteurized, you know, the risk is so low because the controls are so good.